Okay, so hello everybody. This is Kirsten Conrad from Cooperative Extension in Arlington and Alexandria. I'd like to welcome you to a program today on composting. Um, what is it? What to you? And why does it matter? Uh, we have a big problem here in Arlington with people dumping um, organic waste onto the parkland and the um, public areas that we all need to be able to keep nice. And we'd like to talk to you about how we can help manage organic waste from our gardens and from our yards and um, how we can help our neighbors understand what to do about it too. Today's presentation is going to be mostly presented by Nina. Um, uh, Nina is, is a master gardener and she is, has very experience with this topic and um, uh, has been delivering it a couple of times now this year already. Mm -hmm. I'm so, passionate about my compost. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, welcome everybody. And uh, we'll get started with our talk on what to do with our waste, our yard waste and food scraps waste. So today, uh, the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia who are volunteers for Virginia Cooperative Extension, uh, we serve Arlington and Alexandria and we try to educate the residents of Arlington and Alexandria about the best gardening practices. We use scientific, uh, tried and true, uh, evidence-based knowledge from Virginia Tech, and we offer a variety of, um, of, of things for you. Right now we have some that are on hold, but we're doing a good job with the, with the classes and our help desk is still operating online. We'll give you more information about the website or about the email where you can send your questions, photos, and anything that you might want to know about gardening to these groups. The plant clinics are on, on hold right now, but once the quarantine breaks, we'll be back at the libraries, sitting there waiting for you to bring in your plants that have diseases or any kind of questions that we can help you with. Our classes are now being brought to you on Zoom, which has been very effective. And we've been reaching a lot more people than usual, so we do have some benefits from the quarantine. We have demonstration gardeners that are not really uh, being maintained optimally, but they are open for us to go kind of walk through and see how beautiful they are. We do kind of sneak in there and maintain them, but not to our optimal degree. We have an online seed distribution project with uh, the information on how to get seeds will be delivered at the end of this presentation. And our website is uh, www.mgnv.org, and I'm sure a lot of you already know that. There's a wealth of knowledge on the website. So Kirsten. Yes, um, one of the problems that we are experiencing in Arlington is an overabundance of garden debris. Um, trash cans are overflowing, people, you know, the, the pickups have stopped and we will talk about that in a little bit later. But we would like to promote, propose to you that dumping this garden debris on public land like parkland is not the best solution. We have um, very many issues that are associated with dumping of organic debris, no matter how well intentioned on public land. Uh, with County park staff, first of all, there's a spread of invasive species. And if you have garlic mustard or English ivy that you have pulled up from your garden, and, or even just seeds from plants that do not belong in our native spaces, those seeds and clippings can sometimes get a start in our public spaces and cause problems. So the spread of invasive species is a big concern. And by the way, this week is National uh, Invasive Species Awareness Week. So um, if you haven't already been a uh, part of it, try to go to the um, um, National Capitalist, uh, really great website. Um, unsightly public parks is another problem for those of us who are enjoying the outdoors right now. And of course, it makes a whole lot more work for the um, staff at, um, at our county parks, which are laid short right now because of COVID-19. Finally, I just really want to say to you that these piles um, are sometimes put in place by well-meaning individuals who say, oh, this is going to be wildlife habitat for native animals. Well, it's also wildlife habit, habitat for unwanted animals. And if you have a debris pile um, adjacent to your yard, it may be provide shelter for 
creatures that you would just as soon not want to have in your yard. So let's talk about how we can get rid of some of this stuff and not dump it on public land. So there's some responsible options for us. They're easy to take and they're much better for environment in our parks. Uh, we can take them to yard waste designated county sites. I have that information at the end of the uh, presentation. Both Arlington and Alexandria have sites where you can bring your trash in containers that can be emptied or paper bags which are supplied and are free. You can pay for yard waste removal. They have commercial companies that can do that for you just in the interim until we get the county back up and running. They have uh, com commercial curbside uh, compost pickup. And one of the ones that I know some of the neighbors in my neighborhood use is the compost crew. And I was thinking that if you had a few neighbors that really could not fill a five gallon uh, uh, drum in a week, you could probably get together and put all your food scraps in that weekly, which would be really good for the environment. You can also drop food scraps off at the county food drops. Arlington has one at the Earth Center on, uh, down in Shirlington. I'll give you that address at the end. Alexandria is suspended their food scrap pickup right now until, until after the quarantine. And then, my favorite, there's always home compo composting. So what's stopping you from, from composting? Um, yeah. Go ahead, Kirsten. We certainly have uh, many people that say that there is a significant inconvenience to trying to manage a compost pile in their own properties. Um, this is true of people that have very small yards, and the idea of keeping a pile of rotting plant material in your corner of your yard is just not appealing to very many people. Well, we have other options. <laughs> <laughs> But um, there is a really great, there's some great benefits to be had from creating your own compost and using it in your property. Significantly, um, many people are also not sure of the rules and the laws that govern the disposal of, of organic waste. And certainly those things have changed recently, uh, which is so true. You know, every time you think you know how it's going to go, it changes, right? Right. Yeah, of course, some people don't have space or time to do this. And lots of people are afraid that their piles will attract rats, birds that will throw their stuff all over the yard, squirrels, and other kinds of animals that uh, will dig in the pile but who are unwanted. It's true. There is some effort involved with doing it right. And um, I would submit to you that it's no more effort than simply you would expend um, with any other kind of uh, preparation of organic waste for your yard. And this effort is well worth it if you just understand why it's important and understand the benefits of the final product that you can get with you just expend this little bit of energy. Exactly. Some of the classes that we do are designed to help dispel some of these um, um, misconceptions, I suppose, and of course to help people understand how to do composting to begin with. It's true. I like to be responsible. I think it's inconvenient to make my bed every morning, but it's still a good thing to do. And people say they don't know how to compost. Well, I disagree. I think people know how to compost because if you've ever opened your refrigerator, or went to get a piece of bread in a bag, or even checked out your teenager's broom, you know that you, you're used to compost. <laughs> so what is compost anyway? Compost is a natural process of decomposition. Things are going to decompose whether you like it or not. It's not, a, it's not rocket science, it's gonna happen. But as gardeners, we want things to happen fast because we want that organic matter now. We want it in our garden. So we're going to show you how to use optimal conditions to get the compost quicker so that you can use it. So what are the benefits of composting and putting soil organic matter? And that's not SOL, I'm sorry, it's SOM. What does this compost do? It feeds your soil. It doesn't really feed your plants directly. It feeds the microorganisms that are in your soil. And what they do for you is create a direct, a direct channel for food for your plants. The bacteria and the fungi 
feed your plants and make them less susceptible to disease. And uh, by doing that, we also change the soil turf and structure. And that is so important for so many other reasons. Uh, it, it holds our nutrients in the soil and it prevents it from leaching out when the rain comes. If you have soil like sand and water goes through that, everything that's, that's of value is gonna get flushed out into the, into the river. Or if you have clay soil that's so dense that the water just sits on top, you have no filtration to, to keep your microorganisms alive uh, underneath. And also, um, we said protects your plants, makes them stronger, and believe it or not, it makes it more weed resistant. So if you love weeding, don't do this because it will, you, you won't be happy. You won't have any weeds. And I have a little uh, illustration of all the little animals that are living in there and they need food. The larger animals and insects need to eat the microorganisms and what they give us is healthier and um, stronger plants. I was going to say that tilf is a really great old fashioned word having to do with the soil structure. Mm -hmm. If a farmer said his ground had good tilf, it meant that you could go out there and pick up a handful of that soil, smell it, crumble it in your fingers. Um, there was no clay stuff, you know, sticking in the balls. But uh, good tilf, that's a word I'd like to see come back because we all need better tilf in our gardens. <laughs> we do. This is a little quarantine gardening daydream. If you're quarantined with your husband, you might like this one. Allow the worms to drag unwanted organic matter deep into the soil. <clears throat> Another benefit of the uh, soil organic matter is, uh, is water. It retains water in your soil so your plants can better tolerate drought. Uh, it retains the nutrients in the water. It makes a solution. It also filters 60 to 95% of all urban storm water. So we don't lose all that silt and the nutrients into the, into the rivers that cause another whole area of problems. Um, believe it or not, the soil will also, um, if, it's, if it's in good tilth, it'll absorb pollutants and allergens. And a little illustration here of how the soil that's healthy uh, clumps together and, and aggregates and will trap all these good air and water and nutrients in the soil. You know, every year we promote um, the use of soil testing. And the soil testing that um, we promote is done in a, in a lab at Virginia Tech. And um, you, can pick, you can still pick up a form and a box if you wish to send a soil sample in. Um, the boxes are currently located in one of two places. There is a container behind the Farrington Community Center, which sadly is closed right now, um, located on the gate of the little garden area that is adjacent to the rear loading dock at Farrington. You can also pick up a soil test kit at um, the Green Street Garden Center, which is located at, Fifth, at um, Quaker Lane and Braddock. Um, so the soil test that you um, might send into Virginia Tech does not test for everything. You know, it tests your pH, it tests taste your major and minor nutrients um, that are necessary for plant growth. It will also test the organic matter content of your soil if you ask it to. And the organic matter content of the soil is um, important in some contexts, but in the context of a home gardener, I can tell you that there's no such thing as having too much organic matter. Organic matter is simply soil in the process of being converted into um, compost. Um, and that organic matter, that, that compost, helps to shelter the soil. I know that's kind of a funny word to think about in terms of soil, but the higher the organic matter level in the soil, the less likely it is to erode the less likely it is to blow away, you know, if it dries up. Um, so the, the organic matter does protect it somewhat, and it kind of provides some of the glue to help hold the soil together. Mm -hmm. uh, it also allows air to um, um, be able to be exchanged and held in the soil. Air is a very necessary component of soil. And um, the air is... Um, um, necessary for plant roots to 
optimize their growth and for the microorganisms in the soil to do what they need to do to provide the nutrients that your plant is going to take up. It's true. I, I like to say with, without SOM, you're SOL in your garden. Um, I know that 6% of, um, no, 8% of greenhouse gases come from food scraps in landfill. And that is six times greater than the aviation sector, which I was really astounded to find that, that, that information. So this is a soil food web. And if you notice, we have organic matter right after plants. Now, if you do not have organic matter in your soil, you're kind of cutting yourself short because the whole cycle is disrupted. And this is what happens when our soil is not fertile and we have to add a lot of chemicals and we get our soil and our plants dependent on us to feed them chemical fertilizers and we're not utilizing nature's, nature's food web to supply nutrients, uh, maintain water and oxygen in our soil. Would you like to add anything, Kirsten? No, I just, I think you said it very nicely, which is that organic matter doesn't matter just for the plants. It really right. matters for the whole basics of the, of the life as we know it in our, in our, our natural areas. Um, one of the major problems with our managed landscape is the use of pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, which actually kill off um, some of these beneficial organisms and delay the, you know, it's kind of um, delay and, and um, hurt the ability of the organic matter and the microorganisms in the soil to feed not only plants, but the other um, you know, animal life, which uh, depends on that. So, um, I always think that nature knows best, but we're always trying to think of quicker, easier ways to do things, but it always comes full circle back to to nature. And uh, even Jack knew that fertilizer was excellent for his garden. He has no weeds, but he has a gigantic beanstalk <laughs> and no chemical fertilizers. So what are the ingredients for compost? It's pretty simple. We need something to put in our compost, organic matter. We need moisture, air, and temperature. And then we just need an environment to help our soil organisms uh, multiply and be happy in that, in that compost to do their job. The kind of rule of thumb is three parts carbon to one part green. Uh, browns make your compost drier and greens will make them deco decompose quicker. They'll, they'll break down quicker. But you need a good mix of these to make your, your mix just optimal for decomposition. So here's a list of some browns, and I think you probably know that leaves, sawdust, wood chips, straw, newspaper, even dried out grass. Now dried out grass is a, is a brown, but if it's a fresh grass, it's a green. And vegetable scraps, fresh straw, you never wanna use hay because it's loaded with seeds and you'll get more than you bargained for. Healthy plant waste. You don't want to put diseased plants in there. Coffee grounds. I think that this is a very um, simplified way of saying that all organic matter, whether it looks brown or whether it looks green or whether it seems dry or whether it seems wet, all organic matter is a mix of both nitrogen and carbonaceous materials. Um, for the purposes of what we do with it, for home composting, um, Typically, the, it is enough to know that the material is either a dry brown, um, mostly carbonaceous material, or it's wet and green and mostly nitrogenous material. Okay, and so when you mix them together in the ratio that was on the previous slide of three part browns to one part greens, you get the optimized um, level of, of um, decomposition. Right, but whatever you put in your pile, it's going to decompose eventually. <laughs> now, these are just a list of things that you can find in your kitchen. Eggshells. I like to remember to break everything down into your smallest uh, particles because they will decompose quicker. So eggshells, you want to crunch them up. Fruit and vegetable peelings, chop them up a little bit. 
Halloween pumpkins, just don't clunk that whole thing in the pile. You want to break it up. Crushed crab and lobster shells. And this is a good example of, you know, fruit and vegetables are going to break down a lot quicker than your crab shells and uh, your lobster shells. So just think about that when you put stuff in. Old flower arrangements, coffee grounds, tea bags, hops in brewer's waste, and avoid seeds at all costs. You can also use the water from your cooking, your vegetable cooking. Yep, I use that to water my plants in my house. And I was a little hesitant at first because I thought maybe they would smell like asparagus or green beans, but they don't, and it really does work. And it's easy. Whoops. Stuff from our yard. We already talked about leaves, grass clippings, trimmings from full annuals, small diameter twigs. And remember, all things should be disease free and avoid seeds. I'd like to talk a little bit about the um, problem with using pesticide or herbicide treated materials uh, that uh, was on that previous slide a little bit. The, uh, the materials that have been treated with herbicides, and I guess the thing that comes first comes to mind are grass clippings. If grass clippings have been treated with some kind of systemic um, herbicide, sometimes that herbicide can be um, residual in your organic material. And that, that residual quality will last even though it has been thrown onto your compost pile. And there are many stories of um, compost that has residual herbicides in it that have been used on landscape plantings and have stunted the growth of these plantings. So bottom line is, yes, it's okay to pull up your neighbor's um, <laughs> sort of bagged at the curb, but you need to make sure that they are not um, um, systemically treated with any kind of weed killer. Okay, and this yeah, the same with manure too. If you if you get horse manure, make sure what whatever they're feeding of their horses, because you could get herbicides in those too. That's right. Leaf mold is my favorite. I am crazy for leaves. My husband's always saying, "Don't we have enough? We have enough." You never have enough, as far as I'm concerned. And their pound for pound leaves have more mineral content than manure, if you can believe that. They're just a perfect nutrient for your soil and with this, it's so easy to, to maintain. They're free. You take those bags, and these I will steal from my neighbor, as long as they don't put ivy or whatever in it, if I know that they just have leaves in there. They're mine, and they're in my yard waiting to be used. They're nature's gift, so please save them. And if you don't want them, the uh, Potomac Overlook Garden will love to have them because we have our own compost bin there which is open for food scrap donations. If you follow the rules, we have all the sheets out there. Make sure you follow them. Thank you. And uh, thank you for your contribution and for your leaves. One of the challenges that people have with saving leaves um, is that they are very bulky and they take up a lot of room. And uh, one of the things you can do is to store them until they have broken down a little bit further. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later, aren't we? Yep, we do. We have that. Okay. And here are just some other things that are around the house that you would uh, use. Newspapers, office paper. I had office paper as a no-no, but I've researched it and there are, they don't use any chemicals. I think a lot of things have been updated to be more environmentally friendly. And everything in my shredder goes in my compost bin. Uncoated cardboard. Oh, I use cardboard all over my yard. It it's just great for weed prevention, for the lasagna method where you layer cardboard and you can do leaves or grass, another layer of cardboard. It's amazing. Wood ash, uh, use it sparingly because wood ash is a high, um, it has uh, phosphorus and um, potassium. And if you mix wood ash and, and coffee grinds, it's a really great top coating for your vegetable garden. And, and, you know, just use it sparingly. And it's a great, uh, for the nutrient, it's a perfect balance because you know that the coffee grinds are nitrogen. So you've got your nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Untreated sawdust. I guess the bottom line is everything has to be pesticide free and chemical free. Uh, agricultural manure, uh, again, be careful what they feed their animals. 
you would never use cat or dog feces. They're not vegetarian animals. Animal bedding is rich with, uh, with uh, you know, chickens or ducks or anything like that, or I guess your hamsters or whatever your children might have indoors. Just pitch that right in your compost bin. And aquatic weeds, if you have a, a pond or anything and you wanna clean it out, just dump that in your compost bin. Of course, all natural fibers can be composted too. You could put wool and cotton or whatever. I thought this was adorable. It makes me feel like I have friends during the quarantine. <laughs> and of course, hair, which we hopefully will get back to our hairdresser so we can all see. So these are things that are tough to uh, compost. It, it doesn't mean that you can't use them, but if anyone has ever seen a magnolia leaf, it's, it's so thick and brittle. You, if you don't chop that up, that thing will be with you for years. So just, just be aware that these things will be kicking around in your compost bin for a while. Here are things that you don't want to put in there. You don't want to put weeds in, uh, especially weeds that have gone to seed, poison ivy and basie species. You know, things grow in that compost bin. Sometimes we have, uh, we put our plants in there from the garden and uh, go back there and I'll have squash plants growing out and tomato plants that are, that are growing out. So remember, if you put seeds in there, you're gonna have a nice uh, garden of invasives. You don't wanna put dairy or meat, grease, oil, anything that has insects or diseases, and of course, plants that have gone to seed. That's really good. Black ash leaves or walnuts. They're, not, they're poisonous to the, microwave, the microorganisms in the soil. They don't like the chemicals that are, that are gone from the breakdown of those things. So, um, Kirsten, you have anything to add about what you can put in your compost before we go on to indoor composters? I have some questions here. Um, one of them is, um, does mulch fertilize soil? Does mulch like compost? Mulch is not like compost. Mulch is a different, it depends if you, it depends first of all, if you're talking about leaf mold. Leaf mold is an excellent mulch, but compost, is something that will, uh, it's a more balanced additive for your soil and it'll create a better effect uh, than just leaves itself. You'll get more of a variety of uh, nutrients from your, from your compost. I can add that um, the store bought mulch, if you buy your mulch, what is sold as mulch, especially that which is sold as bark mulch, um, it is. It will eventually break down, and it does eventually provide some organic matter to your soil, but it is not necessarily a decent fertilizer. Okay, this is um, takes a long time for it to break down, and sometimes um, what we buy as uh, bark mulch is not really bark at all. It is um, composed of dyed wood or wood scraps or wood wood splinters wood chips. Um, I'm a big fan of using wood chips, um, what I call arborist wood chips, um, in a garden as a mulch. And eventually that wood does break down, especially hardwood wood chips do break down and make excellent soil amendment. But it takes a long time to do that. Mm -hmm. um, um, but um, you need to be careful about thinking about mulch as being equivalent to fertilizer. Right, and that wood chip is an excellent additive to add fungi to your soil as opposed to the bacteria. Bacteria is mainly the thing that breaks down your compost, but when you add the wood chips, you add an, another diversity to the, for fungus, which is really good. And you can see that in the, when you get leaf mulch, you'll see those white little areas in there when you turn it over, and that's the fungi that's in there, and it's very beneficial for your soil. Uh, it's so another question we have is about is there also about wood sort of related? Um, can ashes from a charcoal grill be used yeah. in a compost? No, no. Uh, charcoal ash and uh, coal ash are not good for your compost. I would just so, do wood. So they should just be disposed of, okay? Yeah. Um, another question is about um, if you have flowers with seeds or invasive plants, and if you put them into black plastic bags, 
and let them break down and solarize inside the plastic bags, would that be an acceptable alternative to taking them to the dumping site? Well, it depends on the temperature. It has to get to at least 140 to 160, and it has to be at that temperature for at least two to three days to kill those seeds. You could, do, uh, you could do that, or you could do a dirty mulch pile where you keep all your seeds and your weeds and just let that keep it separate from your regular compost and just turn it over every now and then and let it really decompose for quite some time. And that might be a good solution also. We're gonna talk about this some more later on in the presentation, but most of us who have home composting operations are working with what's called cold compost. And cold compost is um, that which has not ever heated up. It's going through the decomposition process, but it's not heating up. And um, because it's not heating up, it's unlikely to kill weed seeds and some microorganisms that you may not wish to continue in your, in your landscape. That's right. But indoor composters. Mm -hmm. Indoor composters are really good for uh, apartment dwellers or people that don't have a lot of space. And this one I, I think is interesting. It's called the Bokashi system, but it really requires an, a step after that. What it is, it, it does uh, decompose all things, meat, cheeses, anything in small quantities. And you, what you layer it with is a uh, inoculated wheat. It's used with the barley uh, wheat and they inoculate it with what they call an EOM or effective uh, microorganism. And that actually breaks down your compost in an anaerobic method. So you'll put your food in, you'll layer it with your uh, inoculated uh, seed and keep laying it until it's full. And then you'll sit it for two weeks and let it decompose. But the result is you get an excellent tea from this, Bocacci tea, which is very, very concentrated. I think you want to dilute it to one to 100 and excellent. It's good for, we'll talk about teas after a while at the end of the presentation, but this is a really good thing, a uh, good pro. Another pro is uh, it's quick, two to two weeks, but after that you have to take it and you have to finish it, you have to bury it, and it takes a couple of days for it to neutralize the acidity before you can actually plant in this. But it's, it's a good method. You usually need two of them because you probably fill one and you have to wait while you're waiting for the, that one to be done, you can use the other one. This process can be a, a DIY. If you don't, it's gonna cost you about $130 for this process. This one I kind of find really interesting. It's an electric counter composter and it uses air and heat and pulverizes your food and after you eat, you put everything in it, meat, food, cheese, everything that you have left over during the day. And it takes about two to four hours to cook and, it, and immediately you'll have this compost, which sounds like, I think everybody should have one of these. <laughs> Vermicomposting is interesting and it's, it's easy, but you have to, you know, you'll, you'll have to kind of play with it. It's like having a pet that will eat all your food waste and give you some really good compost. It's called worm castings, and it's exceptionally good for your garden. What you need is a, is a, a container. You can use a plastic bin or you could buy one. Uh, you can use a trash can and you make a little bed in the, in the bottom of it for your worms. You will use like dirt and sand and some cardboard or scraps of paper and you'll put your worms in there, let them get accustomed to the new environment, and then you'll start feeding them. And they'll tell you if they like something or if they don't like it, <laughs> because you'll know what they're eating and uh, you'll get used to what they eat and how much they eat. And once they finish that one portion, you move them to the, you put more bedding down and you keep feeding them until your bin is completely full. George Johanina? Yeah. Can, 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 it's this is Peter Markham. D Hold do on. you do you you do you need a, a special type of worm? Just regular? No, no, you do. There's many many different types of worms, but for this, you like a red wiggler or a black or a uh, night crawler, and you can get those at pet stores. You can get them online, gardening supply, or um, bait stores. They have them. Thank and you. And usually, you would buy a pound. 
that's, I think, uh, a family of two or three would need a pound. You would never buy more than two pounds of worms. That would be overkill. And it but, depends on the size of your container. But uh, a pound of worms would be sufficient to start out with. And May, uh, may, may if, I ask you, have you, you've actually done this yourself, have you? I have not done this, but I do have friends that do it. And what happens is, the reason why I know is my friends do it and these worms multiply. So after about 90 days, you're gonna have more worms and your friends are gonna be asking you if you want to take some worms off their hands so that you can start <laughs> your own garden. And- uh, Yes, okay. <laughs> you know, so that, you know, you can always put the worms in the garden or start right. another bin. Okay. Thank, thank and, you. Uh, when you do travel, if you're afraid that you, um, you can leave these, you just sprinkle a top of uh, uh, corn meal on top and that kind of gives them a little bit of a snack while you're gone, they'll break that down. So that's a really good option. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh huh. And you don't wanna put any fatty scraps, you can't put meat or anything, it's just uh, food scraps without, without meat or cheese or grease. So those are some options. And this is a, you know, the both the kitchen countertop and the vermiculturing are, you know, you have end product. If you live in a, an apartment and you don't have any place, at least you're helping the planet and you give your compost to your neighbor or to the community gardens. Okay, now we're gonna go into choosing an outdoor container. And the best container is one that works for you. Okay, you don't really need a container and we'll, we'll go through some things that, that require nothing. These are uh, thermal composting or open air composting where you would just have a bin. You have um, the wooden three, the three bin system where you would start your compost and as it decomposes, you'd move it to the next one so you can fill the first one and the end product would go with the, with the third one. Then these other plastic ones, you, you don't turn those. You just throw the stuff in there. Usually every time you put in a green, you put in a nitrogen, you put in a uh, brown. So you layer it and at the end, the compost comes out the bottom and you use it. Now, like, like Kirsten said, this is gonna take a while because you know it's smaller, you're not turning it. So these things do take a little bit longer and you know, you could just use a wire bin and layer it. A lot of people do that and it's stationary, so you can let it sit there until it's done and pick it up and push the undecomposed stuff away and use what's on the bottom, put it right on your garden and, and start over again. We try to talk you into keeping these bins on your own property so that you don't lose the benefits of these nutrients. Uh, right, uh-huh. Uh, this is a way to keep them and corral the, the yard waste that you do have and kitchen waste into a place where you can eventually derive some benefit from these. Right, because your plants and your flowers are taking all these nutrients out of the soil. You take them out, you pull them out, and all this, this, the nutrients and value you throw away. It, it's, it's kind of absurd if, that people do this. So this is kind of a permaculture thing. If you want to read about permaculture, about keeping all your energy on your own land, it's, it's really interesting. This is another type of a, of a uh, compost bin. It's a tumbler or a rotator. So it's kind of trying to cut out the, the turning thing. But when these fill, if you don't have a, um, a way to assist you in turning them, they can be kind of heavy because you're wetting, and it's a wet, big you know pile of compost so it can be heavy but they're they're a little bit easier you know you just dump it when it's done and uh, use what's in there these are also kind of to me they're kind of a batch system where you would kind of keep your your organic material and keep it in there and throw it in you have to really be careful with these because you have to have the right ratio because when you put all your stuff in there and close it up you should really have the optimal proportions in there for it to go quickly. But like I said before, it will, it will decompose regardless of what you do. But I'm always thinking of how I can get this faster. 
This is um, a really great system for those people who are worried about rats or other kind of wild animals getting into the compost bin. These are enclosed systems and they can actually um, help limit you know, the exposure of the materials inside the bin to wild animals. Um, one drawback that I have heard from other people about is that these can get tremendously heavy um, with the materials that are inside it, especially if they're wet. And of course, they do need to be a little bit wet in order for the um, decomposition process to work. And so if you choose to go with a system like this, you need to be careful not to overload it. Because mm -hmm. it will get too heavy to turn. Right, and also they're kind of costly. I'm, I'm, kind of a, I'm kind of a free person. I really like things that are free and easy. I don't wanna, I feel like I get more benefit if I get compost without really putting money into a bin. So these are things you could do that don't really cost much. And I have tried, I have tried the, the um, five gallon bucket and it really works. I use it still and I move it around my, in my yard. I bury it. I put holes three quarters of the way up and underneath. I bury it to the lid and I fill it with compost and leaves. And when it's full, well, I, the top goes on there and nothing gets in it nothing it's perfect and after a while everything decomposes and i do it a couple of times in one area and then i'll take it and move it and it's really a great a great method and this one's okay but i really like i have another one that i'll show you later on it's a metal one and i find that this one the rodents can chew through so i would you know it depends if you don't have any good but i have problems with people that feed the birds that bring some rodents into the yard and here's one that they use it on the bottom here she used a drum and a little you know, wooden stand for it and the other one used an old uh, looks like a, a water water bucket they use so i guess it's food grade container that you buy and put a top on it the plastic ones i'm kind of suspect because i know rodents can get through and I don't know if anyone has had problems with rodents, but they're, they're pretty, pretty relentless. So you have to outsmart them. So I would, this, out of all these, I'd go for the five gallon bucket. Okay, so here are some fancy ones. Uh, if you wanna get fancy personally, uh, I don't know, it depends on your neighbors if they, if they have a, an objection to, to your compost, but I really don't think, you could always share some with them and then they'll love you. This is something that's available at Arlington County and it's $20. I looked it up online and uh, online it's $36. And, and it does expand, the one that I bought expands to a six, six foot circle. So if you just wanted to do a bin like for in the interim with your yard waste, you could throw everything in there uh, and just let it decompose and whatever's not decomposed by the time if you wanna put it in your trash bin when we resume that, you can do that. But this one's really cool for leaves. This one is a cold pile, it's a continuous one, and they call it cold, it's not because it's small, it's just because it's, it's not turned. So if you have a big yard, an acreage, you can have a small corner where it's not near anybody else's property, you can do this. You can pile up, you know, the tree limbs or whatever you'd like. And of course it would work better if you cut them up or chip them, but it's a possibility. As long as, I guess the main thing that we're trying to say is keep your waste on your yard and it's, it's for your benefit. And we were talking about just the size. The minimum size of your compost pile should be three by three by three. Uh, it should never be higher than five feet if it gets higher than five feet, uh, you want to, you know, spread it out. Don't make it higher, make it longer. And if you think about who's going to turn a five foot, you know, pile of yard waste, it's, it's really hard. You're going to have to have some kind of equipment to do that. So keep it, you know, between three and five feet. And if you want to get a turner to make it easier, but you can do pieces of it every now and then. But, and, and then again, you don't really have to turn it, but the maximum size should be that too. 
to maintain the heat that's given off by the organisms that are decomposing the organic matter. Well, I want to jump in here and just say that to remind you all that you can have a smaller compost pile. Okay, you can have a, you know, a two by two foot compost pile. You can have a bin that's is much less than three by three by three. But if you want it to get hot enough to kill the weed seeds and other kinds of um, to, uh, you know, non-desirable germs that are in the waste, you're gonna have to have a temperature that is only achievable if the pile is this minimum size. Right, and just remember that anything is gonna decompose. You can't stop that from happening. But in this context, we want it fast. We wanna use it. This method I was suspect of, and I did try it, and it works great. I uh, actually do the one where I dig holes in my vegetable garden between the rows and I bury my uh, food scraps. No one has, has bothered the area, and it's been over a month. Uh, I do put some, some slate little things on top of it because I was a little worried, but it's a great system if you um, don't have a bin or you just wanna do something simple. It's kind can of- I tell, yeah. Can I just tell a funny story here about uh, trenching? Please. Uh, this is a shout out to those of you who are at home making bread. I've seen so many posts on social media about people so proud of their home baked bread. Well, I used to buy, I still do buy store-bought bread. And um, <laughs> year, I decided to take a loaf of uneaten, stale, white Italian bread and give it to my dog. And my dog took it out and buried it in the vegetable garden. And I laughed and carried on. It was like November or something like that. And um, the following year, February, end of February, somewhere, we were out there digging the soil to prepare it for the current year's garden. And my shovel hit something spongy. And I go, what's this? So I dug it up and here's this loaf of bread that has been so packed with preservatives that it hasn't rotted even after being out in this garden for most of the winter. So um, I don't know what to say, but carry on with making your own bread. Yeah, I would definitely say that. Get back, get back to the homesteading and stop eating things that you have no idea what's in them. I think this quarantine is th making me even crazier with, with thinking about, you know, what you eat. It's, it's just fascinating, all the things that, are, that have come out of this quarantine. This one is a, is a really good one. Uh, I do it just because I'm lazy. My husband usually comes behind me and says, do you want me to pick this up? <laughs> but you have to, uh, no, you don't have to pick it up. You just go through your yard and trim your bushes or your flowering plants or your vegetables and uh, just drop them on the ground. They cover the soil, they break down. We do this with our cover crops at the uh, Potomac Overlook Vegetable Garden. We grow cover crops, we trim them down, we let them sit there, and then we turn it all over and it adds an enormous amount of nutrients because that the plants have sucked it out of the soil, so put it back in there. The materials that you're creating, this is what my grandfather used to do, and he and I would walk through the garden with his hand clippers and his, he would reach down and prune off the top of the plant, he would sit there and chop it out as we walked and it would just drop. And I just wanted to add to what Nina's saying is that the smaller the pieces, the more likely they are to not only break down quicker, but also to, uh, to be unnoticed, you know, it's not gonna look like there's a bunch of stuff laying in your garden. Right. But also, I if, you can, if you can invest in a chipper spreader, if you have so much land and so much plant debris that you might be tempted to dump them somewhere where they shouldn't go, invest in a chipper, in a chipper shredder type device that you can feed your organic waste into. That'll give you a lovely stew of fine shredded material that you can either put directly onto your ground surface, as, it, as in the pictures here, or you can put it into a compost pile. Right. And you can also take your grass clippings. Um, the fresh grass clippings, you can spread them over your flowers or vegetable garden, but don't do it, you know, just do it lightly spreading, because if you take all that grass and you throw it on top of there, it's going to get kind of mushy and gross on the bottom. So you just want to do a light spreading. 
and uh, the rest put in your compost bin. And I've got some examples of what, what comes from uh, lamb's quarter, what, what nutrients. Clover, of course, we know that's a good cover crop. Mint, I'm always chopping mint and it has magnesium and nitrogen, it's great. And we were talking about grass clippings and how you can use a mulcher, a lawnmower mulcher. And uh, this is where we were gonna say, you've got plenty of space underneath your deck. Just put that waste, that grass clippings in a, in a dark bag and throw it under your shed. Nobody will know and you'll have great compost after the summer. So you've got to love your compost. It's going to do so many good things for your, for your yard. This is my yard and this is the little compost bin that I found by the side of the road and brought it home and it's been good to me. I put yard waste or st stuff that I clip, I put in there, um, the things that I don't drop in the yard. I put sticks on the bottom to, to promote uh, air flow. I also have it on top of a pallet. And then I put grass clippings and more, more, more leaves. And I just leave it there. It takes a while, but it's, it's another place to put, put my yard waste. This is a, a three bin system that I made out of free wood that I got from a school that was tearing down a building. And it's hidden in the corner. You can't really see it. Now, I think it's beautiful even if you, you can see it, but it's, it's fabulous. It does so good. And then I keep all my leaves around there. I put them in, in uh, wire baskets for when they're used. And I suck them up with my weed blower, your, you know, the grass blower. It has a suction on it that mulches everything it picks up. So the leaves are mulched. This can is the one I was talking about. It's a metal can, it has holes on the bottom and the top. It's right outside my, my uh, side door and I put my food scraps in there and I have my black bag of leaves. So I put some, some of my nitrogen and I take my leaves and put it in there, I water it and I turn it, I roll it around and I keep it there. And when that one is full, I dump that in my compost in the back and I refill it and it does marvelous things for your yard. I hope you feel, feel the urge to try it out. So now we're gonna to talk to you about, you know, location and a little bit of maintenance tips. So where do you wanna locate this? Do you wanna put it in the sun or the shade? Preferably in the shade, you don't want it to bake. You don't wanna have trouble trying to keep it, keep it moist. You need moisture for your organisms to, to do their job. So if it's in the sun, it's gonna cook and dry out. You want it to be level. You don't want it to be sitting in a pile of water. Don't put it over a tree or you'll be having tree roots sprouting, sprouting through your compost because they love the nutrients that's in there. Don't put it near a wooden fence. It's gonna kind of deteriorate your fence. Uh, keep it near a water supply, preferably a rain barrel because that's the best water you can use. There's no chlorine in it. And maybe you'll just, be starting a new planting bed of some kind, flowers or vegetables, we'll just put it right on top of that. And when you're ready to start your, um, your new garden, you'll be all fertilized and ready to go. That's a really great idea, Nina. You know, if you have a vegetable garden, a raised vegetable garden that has a fence around it that may be used during the growing season to keep animals out, uh, deer and rabbits and so on, Consider leaving that fence up in the, in the winter time and simply filling the garden up with leaves and other kitchen waste over the course of a winter time. And much of that, not all of it, but much of that will be decomposed by the time you get ready to garden in that, in that area again. Right, right. I do it with leaves and uh, right before, like in say the end of April, when you could start to work the soil, I turned it over and those leaves are all deteriorated by the time it's March. It's, it's great. So we were talking about moisture and it's very important because your, your fungi and your bacteria that are gonna break down your compost need a good habitat. And of course we all need water to survive. The consistency of your, of your compost bin or whatever should be like a damp sponge, but when you squeeze it, you don't really get maybe a drop or so. But this is really important, even more so than worrying about your, your green and your brown and whatever. 
uh, it's just how wet is it? If it's too wet, you want to put some some leaves in there and dry it out. If it's too dry, you want to put more yard waste or, or something, uh, you know, your nitrogen. Too much water and you know it will be, it, it'll really smell terrible. You, you'll be getting an anaerobic condition and it kind of smells like grass is rotting. It's just stinky. So, I mean, it's, it's not that hard to maintain. Aeration. Aeration is only if you want to have this done quicker. You want to fuel this, this pile. You want to get all the undecomposed stuff to the middle. You want to make sure the organisms just break everything down in an even way. And if you have a really big pile, it's good to aerate because the larger the pile, the hotter it's going to get in the center from all that energy of your organisms eating up that, uh, with that organic matter. So you don't want to get it too hot because you'll start to kill those organisms off and you don't want that. So you want to keep it turning. And also turning, uh, aerating it, keeps your pile evenly moist. So you'll have a nice you know, mixture of uh, air and water in your pile. You think that you would water it right from the top, but you'll find that if you water your compost from the top, it's like a thatched roof and your water will just roll right off and you'll never get any water to the places that really need it. So water as you're building your pile and, and when you turn. Another example about the power of aeration is I once visited a site in Indiana that had a small field sized backdrop area, which they were taking in deliveries of yard waste from city landscapers and so on. And this yard waste was piled in big long rows on top of this asphalt area. And they would take a, um, um, a large auger, a machine-mounted auger, and would turn those piles over with this machine-mounted auger. We're talking about piles that were, you know, 100 yards long and about maybe 15 feet tall. Um, these giant piles were simply rows were simply turned over. They were going from branches and large yard waste to finished compost in 90 days. Yeah. Um, with the addition of sludge from the local uh, water treatment plant. Yeah, it's, it's a really good site. It, the gorgeous, that humus that's, that's made from that. It, we went, uh, I was helping a friend clean out a house in Illinois, as a matter of fact. And uh, we had to go to one of these landfill or compost, the com commercial composters. And when we drove in and we saw those piles of rich, dark earth, we were like in heaven. It was like, how do we get some of this? It was gorgeous. So if you don't want to turn, there are ways to get around that too. You can put in a PVC pipe with little holes in it, just stick them like two or three of them in your compost pile, or even a chicken wire ring, which you just put in there and the air will flow, especially if you have it on a pallet and you let that air flow right up through the middle, that will help and reduce the need for, for turning your pile. Now you ask, um, well, I was gonna say, how often do you turn your pile? It depends. If you really want it to go, you could do it every day. And if you don't, you don't really need to, but it's gonna take a while longer to decompose. So temperature. We talked about temperature before Kirsten was telling you about, we will never see 160 degrees Fahrenheit in our mulch in our uh, compost piles because we just don't have the mass to to create that that heat i think if we're lucky if we get it to 130 but um, that's just the way it is if you want to make a bigger pile then you'll know that the temperature is good but i think that the temperature for us is we want to heat it up okay we're not worried about it going on fire or killing our organisms so if you do want a hot a hot pile you'll have to turn it it's not a requirement. And when you know when your compost is done is regardless of turning or doing anything, it will never get hot again. It's done. It's not cooking. The organisms have eaten everything to the, uh, to the extent they can. When you take that compost and you take it up and smell it, it smells like the forest floor. It's beautiful, crumply. Uh, it's just beautiful. You might have some little chunks in it. And if you're really, you know, and uh, 
you really want to have the right consistency or even consistency, you can sift it and put the larger particles back into your compost bin for future use. But it, it is a really, it is a joy and it does help your garden immensely. We could talk hours about how it helps your soil. You'll just have to go with us and, and know it does. So what are you going to use your soil? What are you going to use your compost for? You're going to start a new lawn or a garden. You want at least six, uh, four inches of that, of uh, compost on the top of your, of your area. You want to top dress it just to give it a little extra nutrient. You want to have a quarter to a half inch spread lightly around and you work it gently in. Or do you want to use it as a mulch? And then you just spread an inch to two inches around and, uh, and that will really help. So uh, we were talking about soil enrichment, top dressing mulch. Uh, I can't remember my thought on this. Would you like to add anything to that, Kirsten? Um, no, but you can use um, the compost in your flower pots, you know, mm -hmm. tender gardens, you can use it I know some people use it in the house plants. Yeah. Um, as kind of a nutrient rich um, planting mix for plants to go into. Um, it does supply some nutrients. And so I know people who swear by the fact that they never have to add supplemental nutrients to their garden because they're using good compost. Right. Now, that's what I was going to say. I don't know anybody who has four inches of compost to spread all over their yard. We just don't make it that fast. So if you're going to buy it, I strongly recommend that you check out the US um, uh, composting conference. They have a lot of interesting facts and interesting suppliers that they have tested their ingredients and their they're organic and they're good to use. They don't have any sludge in it. They don't have any bad things in it. So you can be sure that um, they'll be good for your yard. Another thing you could do is make tea out of your compost for your, for your other plants. You could even use it as a spray on your plants. If you spray them on the leaves, if you have a disease or something, it'll help you uh, get rid of that disease because the um, bacteria in the tea uh, coats your, your plants and your roots to protect them from disease. So you could try that. And the way you make it is you put your, your compost in a little cheesecloth and soak it in water for a week or two. And then you'll have this beautiful nutrient um, fertilizer and you don't have to use chemicals. So here's some troubleshooting things. Uh, if you go to your compost and it smells like, like ammonia, uh, you need to mix in some dry or your, your carbons. So mix that in and that should take care of it. If it's an anaerobic, if you don't have a lot of air, it smells like rotten eggs, you just want to turn your pile. You might want to add some browns depending on how wet it is. So you have to assess it. You have to assess the wetness and the, uh, the temperature. If your pile is not heating up at all, it just went cold, well, it could be done. Or, or it could be that you're not getting enough air. Uh, it could be that your, small, your pile's too small or you need to check the mixture of browns to greens. And when you play with it, you kind of know what it is. You can't, you can't ruin it, you know? It's just something that you'll, you'll feel for it and you'll know when you're doing the right thing. Once you get it started, it'll be easy. Okay, my pile is attracting rats. Then you don't want to put any meat, cheese, or anything that they would, might want to eat in there. Uh, also, if you keep your pile moist, and if you bury your food scrap additions in the middle of your pile, so you wanna open it up, bury them in the middle and cover it so it'll make it less attractive. Uh, your pile's not active, you might not have either moisture or nitrogen, or it's too small. And if your pile is too hot, God bless you, I don't think we'll get there, but just turn it. <laughs> Uh, any questions before we get into this? Yes, we have one question here about um, compost around trees. Um, if you use compost around trees, first of all, is it good? And second of all, how deep should it be spread around trees? Well, you would be using it as a mulch, okay? And you would only spread it to maybe an inch. 
and just lightly, just to feed the roots a little bit. Uh, it's, it's not necessary to make it too deep and you never wanna go up to the tree trunk, okay? You always wanna, you see these trees and it breaks my heart. I, I have to take the, my little hands and spread the mulch away from the base of the tree because you're going to kill your tree by doing this volcano mulching type thing. Uh, you don't want to, you don't want to put that mulch too high because what happens is your tree will send off roots. And if you do that, if you have piled your mulch right up against the, the trunk of your tree and you move it, you can see that the tree is starting to put out new roots already. So please avoid volcano, volcano mulching. Okay, so what is your experience with these plastic bins or the wire bin and how long does it take for material to break down and become compost? Okay, well, compost is like, it's like chicken soup. It's, it's, it's all or any kind of soup. It's a mixture, whatever you put in it. And uh, I talked about like if you had a pile of wood chips, a pile of straw, and a pile of fruit scraps, which do you think would break down faster? They all have carbon in them and they all have nitrogen in them. But of course the wood chip's gonna take longer and the food scraps are gonna just disappear quickly. So I would say, first of all, it depends on what you have in it. The next is the size of your, of your bin. And uh, if you turn it, and if you do all those things optimally, um, I'm gonna skip down to the end. Well, actually no. A tumbler will take you about eight to tw 10 weeks, depending on, this is an average, I don't know the size of it, but on the average, the tumblers seem to be about the same size. A pile, I'd say between, uh, I'll say three, three to two years, depending on how big it is and how much you turn it. Three months to two years. Vermiculture is eight to 16 weeks. And Bokashi is two to 10 uh, weeks, two to, two to 10 weeks. Yes, two to 10 weeks, depending on how much you have in there. Because the Bokashi, you have to cook for two weeks and then you have to put it in the ground for X amount of time to, to neutralize and deteriorate. Yeah, it really does depend on the mixture of materials and the amount of turning and aeration that gets into them too. Right. We have two more comments here. One person commented about how in vermiculture, they don't like citrus peel, and that's true. Right. Um, remember that. And um, another suggestion, well, to, if, you take, if you are in the habit of burying your kitchen scraps in the garden, you should just use it in different places. And if you burn right. it deep enough, you won't have the problem with, um, with rodents getting into it. Right, you can fuse your, just like you can wear rotating crops, you can fuse your, your insects, your bad insects you also confuse your rats with uh, changing up the spot. That was a good comment. Okay, another question here is about, um, are there any food scraps that are not acceptable in the collection bin at the Trade Center, do you know? Um, not that I know of. They take meat and cheese and everything. Okay. There's also one at Falls Church, uh, which is really close to my house. I know that I'm an Arlington resident, but uh, they have a bin right near the courthouse, not the courthouse, the community center. It's, uh, it's very full. Those false church people are extremely uh, compliant. <laughs> so, so, next, so next we're going to talk about um, what we should do with all that garden waste that Arlington is not picking up anymore. Uh, right. If you're not going to use not, it. The answer is not to throw it over your fence into the public parkland, please. No. And I was pleased to see that, uh, well, let's talk about Arlington. Food scraps are collected uh, down at uh, uh, the site in Sherlington. It's where they have a big transfer station and it's 4329th Street South. They have two big green bins right when you kind of come up the way in the back of the, of the facility. You can't miss it. It's before you go on the scales to go into the, into the lot. And these are the hours, they're Monday through Friday, five to nine, and Saturday, 6.30 to 6 p.m. And they have yard waste collection at that same location, no appointment necessary, uh, eight to 12. And the locations are at the Earth Product Yard, the same place in Charlington as the uh, food scrap. And they also have it on Yorktown 
Yorktown Boulevard. And this picture is a picture of that facility and people are really being good about it. It's also where you have a mulch pickup. Uh, it's right across from Marymount University. Now, when you bring these, you can see they, they follow the rules. You can bring it, the yard waste in a container that can be emptied, or you can get the free paper waste bags at uh, 2100 Clarendon Boulevard. They're free. And I think they have them. Uh, I don't want to say that they have them at, um, I can't remember it, uh, Madison Center. They used to have them there, but I don't know if that one is open. Uh, for larger pickups, they still have, you can still call the county for a scheduled pickup, according to the website. And Alexandria residents, they're temporarily suspending food scrap collection. Uh, if you have food scraps and you want to take a trip just to get out of the house, please come down to Potomac Grove Look. We have a, a compost bin. You can use that. Uh, yard waste goes to uh, Eisenhower Avenue on Tuesdays through Fridays, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's the leaf processing yard. And you drop off in the same, same deal as Arlington in containers or biodegradable bags. They do not take dirt, sod, stumps, rocks, or stones. So don't put that in your bags. And I just put this in uh, just to give you uh, an idea of how much these things cost. This compost wizard, it's a dual composter. It's $279 if anyone has a great desire. Or this thermal wood composter with a soil fence. $199. But my option is before you get all jazzed into composting, try something free. Uh, go on uh, online selling sites, FreeCycle, Craigsite, Nextdoor, or gardening groups, Dirty Girls, Columbia Pike Garden Exchange. And I think Kirsten, you know other ones too. That yeah, might it's Arlington um, Garden Exchange, Arlington County. Um, I also want to uh, promote the use of recycled building materials. Um, if you can, if you're handy with a hammer and nails and saw, and you can build your own compost three collection site, that's really ideal. And if you're not, uh, many construction sites throw away materials like the reinforcing wire. And reinforcing wire is a large mesh, you know, six by six inch type of mesh wire, which is about four and a half feet tall comes in big rolls. They often throw away unused sections of these rolls. This is valuable for so much in the garden, compost piles, trellising, tomato cages. Um, so um, I'm a scrounger from way back. I want to promote that. That's great. I love free. Um, I also say that you can do one with pallets. If you put three pallets together, you can, or four, you can make a nice little corral for your compost. Is that Alonzo Abogadis is still on this call. And if uh, Alonzo, if you want to unmute yourself, one of the important things that we're trying to get across here today is to help you understand how to share with your neighbors um, alternatives to dumping on public land. And if Alonzo would like to speak, I'm going to give him a few moments to say something. Well, thanks, folks. I, I did want to say this uh, this uh, coronavirus has. Uh, has actually caused a lot of different things we were not aware of and that's also dealt with parks i mean it's not easy for anyone and we've all you know we're all dealing with this and um some of the side effects means that people have a lot more time to take care of their yard and so forth and that's what i've done as well it makes perfect sense but unfortunately uh, we have to be careful about what we do with the with, with the yard waste and so forth uh, we've had this problem for years it's just now really really coming to a forefront because now we're seeing this over and over again. And again, we have to worry about it because uh, when you throw all that stuff over the fence, you basically build that big mulch that nothing will go through. So a lot of native plants won't grow. We're worried about it and we, we've already seen this happen. Uh, people pull weeds out of your area and some of those are invasive. And when you put the weeds that you don't want in your garden and you spread them out to the woods, we then have to, um, you know, have to deal with them in natural lands, and that's a problem. 
And we also um, are really worried that this, uh, these kinds of things, not just the spreading of, uh, uh, of things like insects and, and pests, but, but I should say um, actually other types of things, uh, including um, things like diseases and so forth. Uh, something that may be a problem with you if you discard it uh, and just throw it over the fence again onto park property, then that could spread onto park property as well. So again, um, we're just hoping that, that you will help us steward the lands the same as you steward your, your own yards as well. And we're hoping that you do that kind of things. Everything here was, 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 was really great. I really appreciate it. I learned a couple of new things too. And uh, you know, I certainly appreciate this, these kinds of things and these efforts to go out there because you as master gardeners and so forth can help spread the word to other people, whether you write something, Civic Association, you'll spread it to your neighbors. This is important stuff that gets out there and people don't do things uh, because they're, because they, they think it's, it's causing harm. Of course not. Uh, people don't really think that, but we will say that to us, those little minor things can cause harm to our natural lands and that's what we have to worry about. So. Um, I appreciate everything you guys are doing. I appreciate everything Master Gardeners do, uh, including all the education that they not just learn for themselves, but participate and, uh, you know, uh, give out to others. That's important to us. And um, thank you guys for everything that you, do, you guys do. Thank you, Landa. Thank you. Um, there's some publications that we put on here for you to, you know, research composting. And uh, Kirsten, do you want to say something about this? Um, yes, I do. Uh, we have lots of other resources for you um, going on with Cooperative Extension. Uh, first of all, at the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website, mgnv.org, there's an online seed distribution order form, which uh, there are still seeds available for free. Uh, there's a form you can fill out, and we try to um, get you what we have left. Um, there are also weekly online virtual classroom public education offerings that are being done on Friday mornings. Come back on Friday mornings, you can find the entire lineup um, of classes at mgnv.org. Um, these you are required to register for, pre-register. Um, so they're free, um, but you must pre-register for them. The next one we have coming up on Friday is on weeds. And the one the week after is on tree fruit and brambles for small urban landscapes. And there's a whole lineup of more classes for, for June and we're gonna keep on going as long as we have to do that. Um, the help desk, I think Nina talked about this at the beginning. The help desk, uh, which most of you know about, is our um, um, resource for the community where we can do plant identification, insect identification, what is this weed? What is this bag? What is this thing I found in my house? All kinds of questions. All, everything from how do I compost to how do I select a native plant. Right now, uh, because Carrollton Community Center is closed, we are only accepting email. The email address is right there. And if you choose to send a picture to them, we will answer it for you. And if you would like to send pictures, um, uh, with your email, we can, um, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. So take a picture of your insect, try to get as good a close up as you can. If you take a picture of disease plants or other kinds of plant identification questions, try to take it from different angles um, so you can learn as much as possible about the site that it's growing in. Um, finally, if you want to buy composting worms, um, there are some online gardening stores, pet stores, date shops, and of course, if you know somebody who's already vermicomposting, almost always they have worms that they can give you or even sell to you. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to present this information. I hope you enjoyed it. My name is Nina DeRosa, and uh, thank you, Kirsten, for allowing me to present this. It was fun. Um, hope to see you next time. Thank you all for joining us today and um, help us to help control some of the dumping that's going on on public lands by composting and turning your own debris into blackboard. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.